starting. <clears throat> Welcome. Thank you, people, for joining us. Hi, Mike. Hi, Mark. Hi, Reiner. James, Melissa. So many people are coming in. Devin, Brooke, Brittany, Amy. So great to see you all. Mel, we're very excited to have you all here. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Jason and Evan. Um, if I miss your name, don't be too offended. Just trying to see names as they come in. Um, but thank you guys so much for joining us. Uh, we're thrilled to have this amazing group um, of CEOs and founders join us today um, to talk about their experience during the 2008 downturn um, and how it could be helpful to you today um, in what you're going through during this time. Um, so really excited um, to have um, you all here today um, and be part of participating really in this underscore um, event and community. Um, so today is our first intro into our core collective series. Um, really the goal for this series is to uncover and share collective learnings from the underscore core community. Um, so we'll be having a few of these throughout um, the quarter at least, and we'll be continuing on different topics. Um, so we've heard from many people in the core um, that obviously this is a challenging time um, and they want to be able to learn from folks who have gone through a downturn, who have experienced something that might be similar to what we're experiencing now in the economy. Um, so we really wanted to put together this amazing group of panelists and people that have this experience to be helpful for our general uh, core community. Um, so for those who, you know, have probably heard the underscore pitch a few times or those that don't know about underscore, just a few little details about us um, and then I'll pass the baton um, to Lily to get this really kick it off. Um, so underscore BC is a community driven early stage venture uh, capital firm. We back founders from seed to series A um, and it's predominantly in B2B SaaS space. Um, with an emphasis on building here in Boston. We like to say we're Boston biased and really want to support the best companies and founders in the Boston area. Um, what's really unique about Underscore is that we recognize capital as a commodity. So we provide founders what they really need, which is a community of proven experts aligned to help them around their specific needs. Um, so what members of the Underscore VC core community, which many of you are part of, have the opportunity to connect and share their skills and experience in the regular events um, such as these. So we're really excited to welcome people who are with Underscore the first time um, and welcome you back if you've been to um, our events, if you're a founder with us um, and have been to the team. Um, so I will pass it on to Lily. Great, thank you, Jenny. And thank you all for joining us this morning. And thank you very much to our esteemed panelists who are here. Uh, by way of quick introduction, for those who don't know me, I'm Lily Lyman. I'm a partner here at Underscore, background as an operator and as a founder uh, before I jumped over to the investing side several years ago and joined the Underscore team. So thank you all for, for joining us. Uh, I will ask the panelists to quickly introduce themselves. I will um, call on you. And if you could just say your name, your current company and role, and in what your company and role was back in 2008. So we have some context. So I will just go down my screen and Jim, take us sure. off. Uh, pleasure to be here, Jim Crowley. I'm uh, the CEO and co-founder of Forge.ai. Going all the way back to 2008, I was the CEO of a company called Turbine Games and look forward to telling you a little bit about that experience. Great, thanks Jim. How about Jessica? Hi everyone, I'm Jessica DeBlieger. I am the president of C-Space. Back in 2008, I was still at C-Space and I was the head of uh, sales and marketing at that time. Great, thank you. How about Jeff? Yeah, hi, good morning everybody, Jeff Barnett. Um, I'm actually probably the only one here that doesn't have a uh, sort of a, a proper job at this point in time. I'm sort of, uh, you know, I'm teaching now, I'm teaching an entrepreneurship class down at uh, MIT a day a week and working with a bunch of startups, um, uh, you know, on board and investment uh, activities. Uh, you know, I'm a long time, 30 year sort of software entrepreneur, uh, an executive series of companies. Most recently, and certainly pertinent to 2008-9, was I uh, was COO and then later CEO of Demandware. And, you know, from, you know, kind of pre-revenue with that company up through the IPO in 2012 and the Salesforce acquisition where I ran it uh, for a couple of years for Salesforce and 
you know, at the, uh, the time I stepped down, that was a, a billion dollar plus ARR business, right? So it kind of been a 13 year march from zero to a billion. So pretty tough and some hard times in there like 2009, but also some great moments. Right. Thank you, Jeff. How about Raj? Uh, so currently founder of uh, Demand Sage, which is a new marketing intelligence platform for small, medium sized companies that we're launching. In 2008, uh, we were just launching Localytics, uh, which was a mar uh, mobile analytics and messaging platform um, and uh, served that as CEO until 2017. And Localytics was acquired a couple months ago by a company called Upland Software. Raj, you seem to time your founding of companies really well. I'm going to keep an eye on you for the next uh, <laughs> next yeah, week to come. <laughs> Bettina does even better than me. <laughs> so, Bettina, there are macroeconomic. Yeah, one more on me uh, before this. <laughs> Hi, Bettina. Hi, I'm Bettina Hein. I am a lifelong tech founder and um, I actually started my first company in 2000, 2001, a text-to-speech software company called SVOX. And then 2008, I started Pixability, um, which you guys may know in Boston. I started it out of MIT and we help large brands optimize their video advertising on YouTube and other platforms. Um, and right now I'm the founder and CEO of Hello Yellow. Um, a healthcare startup that helps people manage their chronic diseases. So yes, um, <clears throat> ever since I've started, I started right out of grad school. Um, I've been founding companies right into crises. Not on purpose, <laughs> but that's how it's been happening. That's actually a perfect tee up for my first, first question, which I will direct um, at Raj and then Bettina. But you know, we, we often hear the, uh, the opera, you know, the optimistic message that great companies are formed in the times of crisis, and that's all good and well sort of as a tagline, but I think it, it would be helpful to understand a little bit of, of what does that mean and, and how to do that. Uh, so Raj, you know, I think you mentioned to me earlier, you, qu you quit your job in August of 2008 and two weeks later, you know, to, to go after Localytics with full force and two weeks later, Lehman Brothers crashed. So yeah. right, right at the moment. Um, so based on your experience, you know, for founders on this call who are early days or maybe, you know, sort of early-ish in their journey, what is going to set apart the companies founded in this time that will persist and ultimately thrive versus those who might, might struggle? You know, what, what do founders need to make sure they're focusing on if you're starting a company in the times of crisis? Yeah, well, for us, um, you know, when, uh, during the summer, we thought we'd have an easy ride to fundraising and it was anything but. And so we had to bootstrap the company for a little over a year and a half uh, after the financial crisis of uh, 2008 and after we founded the company. But that forced us to be really lean and focused on customer needs. So um, as an example, other companies in our, our space who had raised money before that went off to try to become ad networks uh, because that was the thing to do and that's what VCs were investing in. And a lot of those companies, you know, uh, failed over time, they, they burnt out uh, because that's not what the market really wanted. As a unfunded uh, bootstrap company, we had to work really closely with our customers to understand what they were really looking for and that evolved into, uh, you know, what we became around analytics and messaging. The other thing we were able to do around that time that helped us a lot was use the sort of the lack of, of uh, job opportunities to our advantage to get really, really high quality talent that we might not have gotten otherwise because those types of folks would have gotten sucked up by Google, Amazon, Facebook, whoever. Um, and so it was really important in those early days because we were able to build this high quality core team and that helped us even when the economy got better because those high quality folks helped bring in other high quality folks. Um, and I think uh, that is one reason why you, you can have like really great companies forming during, during a downtime. Thanks for that. I think that the talent piece and the, the sort of brutal honesty from the market and the customers is such an important theme. Um, Bettina, I know similarly, I think you founded companies in 2001, 2008, and now 2020, uh, if I'm getting those, those days relatively right. Um, and you've also been able to, uh, you know, raise funding. And also I know that you've been helping several companies right now get funded in this time. 
Can you share some thoughts about what does it take to get financed in the times of crisis? And you know, how is it different? What should founders be thinking about if they are seeking financing as they're getting started now? Well, the reason I get to help other companies now is that I founded a, a successful company out of the 2001 crisis. Um, also, because I moved to Switzerland two years ago, um, and here I got the opportunity to be a shark on the Swiss version of Shark Tank. Mm -hmm. And so that is why I get to work with a lot of startups now. And um, I feel like grandma telling them stories from the war when I sort of talk about what we did in those crises. And um, the really important thing Raj already uh, touched upon that is to understand what customers want. So um, when, when you are in a downturn situation, you get better feedback from customers. They will not bullshit you um, because um, they don't have money to waste. In a boom phase, everybody has you know twenty thousand here, forty thousand there to do a pilot with you, um, and you know they they might think that's interesting and you know gives them something to do while their you know normal business is thriving. Um, in a downturn, people are just going to tell you the absolute truth and tell you what they're willing to pay. And that's, that's what happened in 2008. I launched also in October of 2008, I launched Pixability as a consumer facing uh, proposition. And by January of 2009, I knew that people weren't buying my stuff. And the people that were buying it had household incomes of a quarter of a million dollars or more. I was like, that is not a consumer product. Um, and so I knew what I need to do. First of all, I really wanted to bootstrap something, but I, I you know, tucked in my, my tail and said, okay, I have to go back to the investors. So I went to, to investors that financed me previously. And I said, look, <laughs> I can't, I will not be able to do this um, oh, just with my own money. Can you write me a check? And you know, with the humility that's necessary uh, to do that, I asked for that money, and I pivoted back to something that I knew. Um, you know, I went into B to C, and then I said, you know, uh, this is not really what I'm able to do. So I went into B to B, and um, that kind of is some you know advice that I would give founders: is right now, don't change too many parameters around what you're doing. Pivot uh, to something where you have real expertise and, um, and then go very deep with customers. That is something that um, investors will always appreciate. They will always um, help out companies that have deep expertise that know what customers want. Great, thank you. Um, I also just want to acknowledge there's some good questions coming into the chat, so please keep them coming. I will try to weave them in, but also we have time um, you know, reserved at the end to make sure we can address all the questions. So please do uh, do put them into the chatter. There was one uh, from Mark that was sort of a reflection, I think, on your remarks, Bettina, and actually sets up well a question I have for Jeff, which is around this idea of customer orientation. And you know, we've spoken to a lot of founders about this idea of keep you know treat your current customers like prospects. Uh, and Jeff, I think you use the term, now is the time to hug your customers, uh, which I like and I think is very relevant. But I've also heard under, entrepreneurs sort of struggle to, I understand this concept, how do I do that? What does that actually mean in practice? Uh, what are some of the specific approaches to hugging your customer that you learned in 2008 from DemandWorks that, that might be applicable today? Because you guys did some pretty creative things. Yeah, it's great. You know, hugs. Um, I guess I've got hugs on the mind here, being sheltering in place for the last month. I, uh, <laughs> I'm craving. I'm craving human interaction of some sort. <laughs> it's, uh, but no, seriously. You know, um, in a downturn, there are a lot of things that are vying for your attention. You've got all the drama internally, trying to figure out how you get your budgets right size, potentially layoffs, realigning people, and of course, there's all the stress around the pipeline, which seems to be, you know, drying up in front of you. Right. So. Uh, in the backdrop of that, don't forget about your customer. They really are your lifeblood. And, uh, you know, it's, I think we all know it's tough to win new customers in a recession. So it's really critical to, uh, to bear hug them, right? 
preserve that base and minimize churn. And, and remember, you know, your customers um, are going through their own crisis, right? So they're doing their lifeboat drill. And what projects are they going to throw overboard? What uh, staff cuts or changes are they going to make? Uh, what vendor contracts are they going to terminate or restructure? Always a nasty, you know, not a word you want to hear um, you know, from your customer in this time. So, you know, the mission here is like, make sure you don't get over, uh, thrown overboard. And then, you know, just to um, uh, underline what Bettina said as well, I mean, there's great learning from the customers uh, in the midst of a downturn. The stuff does really get real and you learn what's important. So listen, if you're not making the lifeboat drill, right, and uh, your company and your proposition is getting cut or uh, the risk of doing so, uh, that's, it's tough, it's tough uh, information, but it's good information. And, and part of the mission is to figure out how you get more and more relevant. So this was a big learning for us at Demandware in 2008 and 9. And, you know, I'll give you some practical advice on this, uh, on this the, a couple things we did. You know, the first was um, uh, we really set up what I'll call kind of a customer mission control. We sat down. We didn't have many customers then. We were still pretty small. And uh, we mapped every single customer, right? So looked at everyone, looked at what we uh, assessed, what we thought uh, the risk was around churn for that customer, how they were doing on KPIs or utilization, uh, and put together uh, plans around each one, how we were going to mitigate that. So this became a cross-functional exercise, really with every department on a regular basis every week. Uh, you know, uh, reviewing the customers and figuring out how we get close to them and do it. Which leads to sort of my second piece of advice on this um, we employed is move in. I think pertinent to the questions that were just asked, like move in with your customer. I mean, live with them. If you have to in this world, do it virtually, uh, but learn where these customers are struggling, where they're having challenges uh, and how you can um, uh, help them to get more value solve the problems, get more value out of your software. So give you an example of that, you know, demand where we were selling, of course, to retailers and brands who had e-commerce businesses. And of course, retail got hit really hard in 2008 and nine and uh, bankruptcies, store closings were rampant and frankly, hard to believe, but digital was not really mission critical at that time. Uh, and so there was a big belief in retail that what we need to do is narrow the ranks around our kind of core uh, store based business e-commerce is less important. And as we got close to our customers through this, this process, we kind of realized a lot of them were really underperforming when it came to their e-commerce websites. Uh, they were not performing well. They weren't really relevant. They, uh, the staff was in many cases frustrated and struggling. Um, and so we ended up, and it was, it was for a variety of reasons. It was um, not using the, the software properly, all the features and so forth. But in many cases, it was about best practice, just uh, expertise around digital marketing or search marketing or merchandising on a website um, and so forth. So we ended up deploying teams uh, of experts from the company out in the field with our customers and really sat with them. I mean, we were literally sitting in the field side by side with the merchants using our tools. And we learned a ton about, uh, you know, where, uh, where things weren't working, what training would need, was needed, where the opportunities were to get them really performing better. Uh, that came back ultimately in the form of, you know, product enhancements we made and, and so forth. But also, this really became kind of the impetus for us to create a real customer success function. We kind of realized that, you know, delivering the platform and the software was a piece of it, but we needed to also deliver expertise and knowledge and know-how in concert with that. And we had to figure out a way to propagate that. And so we started really in the heat of the 2008-09 crisis, uh, working with customers and you know, just to kind of, you know, close out that story, you know, so as we worked with these customers and got their sites performing broadly over the course of 2009, we made a real material difference. We ended up, uh, you know, on average for those customers where we engaged, we got about 5% revenue lift. So they're generating 5% more e-commerce revenue, which obviously was a big deal for them, but also dropped right to our bottom line. It was very material for us in terms of filling, let's see, shoring up the shortfall in terms of our, our, our plans to fund the company and support the company. So really a big, uh, big deal. And then, you know, one other thing as well is we're in there uh, learning from our customers and working with them. We also saw opportunities and uh, you know, to uh, you know, let's we'll kind of win-win opportunities where we could deliver value to them. Um, and uh, you know, opportunities for us to um, uh, you know, uh, you know, it's a lot easier to sell into your base than when you met new customers, of course, and we saw opportunities in white space to really expand. So, 
for example, we had several customers at the time that had stopped their rollouts of their e-commerce sites on our platform to different countries. Uh, and in many cases, we jumped in, we were uh, actually providing uh, gratis, in many cases, services to help them get those sites launched, to get them over the hump, which ultimately led to uh, long-term revenue commitments for us, which was good, but also led to near-term revenue uh, in a win for the customer. So really a win-win opportunity. Actually, in one case with a big uh, global uh, sportswear manufacturer, um, they had made a big commitment to on-premise technology, actually a company called Hybris, which was sort of an arch competitor of ours in the day uh, that was doing it on-prem in kind of big, expensive on-premise projects. Well, they were trying to roll this thing out uh, globally when the crisis hit, and we had done a small tactical site for them in Eastern Europe. Well, when uh, suddenly all the budgets were froze up and what have you, we saw the opportunity to pounce and went after them with a very uh, attractive proposition to go ahead and uh, roll out ultimately, which was all their big Western European countries to bring it to demand wear uh, and us absorbing a lot of the cost. And in exchange, what we got from them was uh, long term commitments and a, 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 an ARR stream that was going to carry the company uh, very strongly into the future. Right. So really a win win opportunity and a chance to supplant a, mm -hmm. uh, a key competitor at a time. But frankly, these were brands at this stature. We were not getting, we couldn't even get in the door in many cases. The crisis really was sort of a blessing in disguise. It opened up people to uh, the cloud model and a different way of doing things. Mm. That's an important reflection as we're seeing sort of a lot of industries, there's sort of the, the meme going that this is catalyzing digital transformation for a lot of industries. And it sounds like back in 2008, that was a similar experience. You mentioned a couple important things which have triggered some questions. So I make sure I weave them in and, and might open it up a little bit. So one very tactical question that I've heard several folks ask, and, and it's actually on this thread, um, and I'll open up to any of the panelists. What's your view on adjusting pricing models and contract structure to customers in this time? Is that part of hugging customers? And is there tactical ways to think about that? And so you're not setting expectations for the future, but, but maintaining customers if needed. And particularly in the world of you know, perhaps brands or retailers, I know Jessica, you, you work closely with these folks as well. Um, anybody have strong opinions on what's the right approach to thinking about your pricing structure uh, to keep customers at this time? I'll, I'll jump in here. Um, if you know your gross margins, um, uh, cash is king uh, and Yes, you have to be worried about the long term, but based on where you are in your maturity curve, uh, you have to get to, you have to survive. Uh, so if you can be more attractive on your, your pricing, you should be. We're, we're evaluating that right now. Um, so I would encourage people to do things that drive velocity. Yes, you need to be worried about what happens a year from now or two years from now. But your first mission is to get to a year from now, two years from now. Um, so... Um, Again, it's so situational based on your, your unit economics and, and your runway. Um, but uh, I encourage people to be flexible to meet the market where the market needs to be to allow you to drive forward. Mm -hmm. and, so I, yeah, have, and, I have a little yeah. story around that as well. Um, at SFOX, my first company, um, we started out in the telecom market with text-to-speech. We thought it was uh, text-to-speech was going to be reading a directory assistance out loud and maybe at a certain point email and we figured out that um, at a certain point there was a thousand dollars per telephony ch channel and we thought we had a business model and that went down after the telecom crash in 2001 the prices went down to under $200 uh, for a telephony channel and um, that meant that there was not enough channels in the entirety of Europe um, because the company was based in, in Switzerland, um, for us to really ever have a market. So what we had to do is we had to find a different market to go after where the addressable market and the economics made sense. And um, what, um, what was interesting for us was that um, we were able to maintain, we got into the auto industry and uh, made voices that spoke street names uh, for navigation devices um, as embedded software. And what, um, what we figured out is that um, if we play the high quality card, 
um, but have lower integration costs, we can really make money. So what happened was that we were charging, um, so there was a, a price per car that went off the assembly line that we that you would get for your software. And our competitors were offering $1, $1.50, um, but they needed a lot of integration, NREs, non-recurring uh, engineering expenses. And um, what happened is our costs were very small. We figured this out because we could port uh, to new uh, platforms really quickly in new languages. And so what we did is we said, okay, we'll do this for a, a lower integration price, but you're going to pay us $4 once that comes off the line and that we knew that that was two or three years out because this was the the auto industry but we made all of our money um, essentially we could pay for the integration with that pilot money that we got the nres and then two or three years later um we were printing money because we'd covered all our costs and every car that went off the assembly line paid us money so uh, the message is don't uh, compromise on the long-term unit economics. Um, look at the short-term things. And uh, you know, that, that was um, uh, the stories that the others told as well. Don't try to sell $10 bills for $5. Mm. I mean, I think probably another way to another, just to build on that is, is, and again, ties back to the earlier conversations around knowing the customer, like really understanding what they value and then understand your gross margin allows you to actually price that way a bit and make sure that you're putting the cost against the stuff that they're willing to pay for. Mm. And maybe you give some stuff for free to get them in the door to get things rolling, but just thinking creatively around where is their value and how much gross mar margin do you have to play with gives you a lot of flexibility as you think about that pricing and you know, getting the engagement started, which I think is always the hardest part. <laughs> And then, of course, if you are hugging your customer once you get them started, um, plenty more opportunity along the way. But it is about that, that initial beginning. And particularly in this environment, I think getting new clients, new uh, customers right now is really hard. And so being as creative as possible is important. Really and I just add a couple things on the customer stuff, though, because I, I, I love all this conversation around the customer. And I have seen a bunch of comments around just like what does a customer what does customer centricity look like and like how do you get people how do you get customers to want to be involved when they're so busy themselves at this moment and i you know i really think the opportunity with customers is some of what you talked about jeff but in in, in different terms it's inviting them to be part of the solution so really switching the mindset from i sell this stuff to customers or customers are sales numbers or customers are targets and um, reframing customers as your most most critical sort of partner in figuring out where your customer goes, where your company should go next. So invite, literally inviting customers to be to play a major role in shaping the investment decisions that you make, in shaping the way that your product goes forward. You know, like really giving them a very clear seat at the table along with also enrolling your employees. So I think the two, it, it's amazing to me, and I work with big brands mostly, and so I think actually startups are in a much better position to do this than big brands are. But like the, the greatest asset any company has is, is, are its employees and its customers. And somehow, oftentimes, those two groups of people become numbers and scores and like data points instead of these incredible human emotional assets that they really can be, um, both in terms of shaping the future of the, of the business, as well as like being your eyes and ears around what the barriers are that are getting your way of getting to that next level and being, playing an active role in helping you get there. So, you know, that would be my advice in this moment is double down on employees and customers as your greatest, greatest asset mm -hmm. to help you kind of lean into what your future self can and should be coming out of this crisis or shaped by this crisis, because there certainly is opportunity in this crisis. Um, it's just a matter of rallying, rallying your most critical assets around what, what your opportunity is, you know, helping them, asking them to help you shape it, and then being really critical players and helping you to roll, roll into that. Hmm. I like that framing a lot, uh, particularly on the people, and, and how do you bring those two groups together? Raj, did you have something else you wanted to add on the customer? Really quickly and really tactically to uh, Michelle's question around pricing, how do you make it not stick in the future? 
uh, do a temporary like COVID-19 rebate discount, put a time frame on it, like three months, and then you can always extend that. Um, don't just give a discount without very clear like line item around why that discount is being provided because mm -hmm. you're right, you won't be able to take that back. Uh, it'll be really difficult to take that back um, if you don't do that. Mm. That's a great point. I think we heard some great yeah. things around. Or go ahead, Jeff, do you have something else you want to add? Yeah, I just, I mean, I can't resist um, layering in on such an important conversation. I think, um, you know, fully agree. Like, you, listen, you need to, all you're going to do if you, um, if you stonewall the customer when it comes to uh, them, you know, they're in crisis too. And we all talk partnership when times are good. When times get tough, you find out really who your partner is. Mm. And so you've got, you've got to be willing to, uh, to work with the customer. And I think in that is great opportunity, right? You gain a lot of trust, uh, but you can position yourself really well. And, and so, you know, um, well, for example, what we found was in 2008 and 2009 that, you know, there was obviously there was a cash crunch and all the retailers and brands we were working with, they were short on cash near term. That was a big deal for them. And so we started looking at this in the form of like a give to get, right? So when you think about restructuring your contract, and you know, I think you need to be willing to do that. Um, you need to do it in the form of, okay, we're going to give them this, which helps them, but we're going to get, we're going to get this, which helps us. So concretely, what that meant for us, you know, at Demandware was, you know, we gave up on a lot of the cash up front um, and uh, minimum commits in terms of the subscription fees. But what we got in exchange was, um, you know, longer terms. Mm. Right. Uh, in some cases, additional pieces of business that would come to the platform down the road, higher marginal rates you know, or sort of transactional fees uh, as well. But actually, uh, kind of come back to some of the questions around gross margin and the actual you know, health of the company. Um, as we came out of the downturn, it positioned us with, with a much better rolling ARR stock than we would have had if we'd really stonewall. Mm. Uh, we also built you know, lifetime relationships that... Uh, you know, you really, in the, in the heat of that, when people are suffering, um, I've got a million stories here on this. Um, if you help your customer find their way through it, uh, you, you gain a lot of loyalty that can pay dividends for years to come. So really think creatively. I would just urge you and find that win-win. Don't give it, you know, to Rosh's point, don't give anything away for free necessarily. You know, think about what uh, is of high value to you that you'd want to trade off for that and make that, make that uh, proposition. Mm. I also think it's a great opportunity to build loyalty with employees right now too, like trust and loyalty with employees and have them, you know, be, be invested in, in the organization in a way that when times are good again, and there's lots of offers out there that they'll be invested in your organization. So I think that's a, just a build on that. Mm. I think that's a, it's a hugely important point around team as an asset and how you manage them and, and communicate with them. Um, uh, I want to, there's sort of one or two other questions on customer side, but perhaps we'll come back to it because I think there's another um, bucket of, of themes that we hear a lot that I'd love to make sure we cover, uh, which is the idea of strategic, you know, strategic pivots. I think some of you have sp spoken to these already and also playing offense. And so many founders debate whether they should, you know, stay their course, whether through, or should they pivot? And if so, you know, how much of the company and resources should I direct at a pivot? Is this a bet the farm moment and how do you make some of those decisions? So uh, Jim, I'm going to tar target you with this one. You know, in 2008, you led Turbine in a fairly significant pivot that ended up being hugely important for surviving and thriving in the time. Um, you know, based on that experience, what were the triggers that drove that decision making to make this pivot? Sort of how did you make this call of should I play offense or defense? Uh, number one, meta comment. I, I think uh, you're always playing offense, um, just as a general rule. Um, situation at Turbine, for those who don't know, to go back to 2008, Turbine was a game company. We built what were called MMOs, massive player online games. Uh, our biggest competitor would be uh, World of Warcraft, Activision um, at the time. Turbine, the situation was we had very significant IPs and these games are very large, very complicated, very, they're battleships, they're very hard to change. Uh, and they have lots of sunk costs. So the, the triggers when 2008 hit and we weren't hitting the monetization curves we needed to hit to be successful. Uh, so the question became, 
what could we do and what are the assets we have? Our key assets were obviously our team and Turbine had an extraordinary team. It was a large organization, about 400 people. Um, but our key assets, our monetization assets were our game at our game engine, our game technology and the IP games that we had out there. Lord of the Rings Online, Turbine, uh, excuse me, Dungeons and Dragons, Ashram's Call. They were very important pieces of IP. They followed a traditional model, model in that you would sell them at a store in a SKU uh, and people would load the disc on their, their computer. Sounds very trite and old fashioned now, but that's the way it largely was done in 2008 for AAA entertainment properties. When we looked at the landscape here, when we knew we needed to monetize more aggressively, the short story is, could we build a new game in the time we had? Uh, and the, the reality is we couldn't. Um, could we fundamentally accelerate the monetization uh, process with our existing games? Uh, they weren't driving the monetization curve for a number of reasons that we weren't gonna have time to change. So we, we were down to almost that last conversation, what could we do to fundamentally change here? And we, with a lot of analysis, we narrowed it down to how do we pivot an existing AAA entertainment property in a free to play mode? We had three different games. We focused on one specific game, Dungeons and Dragons Online. And we aligned, I had a great group of people around the company uh, and we made this the single greatest priority how do we take this existing game, deal with game balance, game economy, insert in-store merchandising and entertainment into an online existing property with hundreds of thousands of players, totally change the experience and change the monetization curve. There was a lot of complexity to it. The, the long and short story is that pivot was a bet the farm moment. We, we had to be successful on it. So there was a lot of analysis into how we chose Dungeons and Dragons and what we were going to do there. We put all our resources to uh, aligning. We had to keep our other monetization curves going because they were providing needed cash flow to allow this to happen. But uh, all, of, all other resources were driven to make this successful. Um, when we affected that change, a couple things happened. Number one, uh, our monetization, our daily active users went through the moon uh, when we went free to play because we removed the price barrier. Two, we had hundreds and hundreds of thousands of players as daily active users, and we had people spending 20,000, individuals spending $20,000 a day buying virtual swords and, and things of that nature. The monetization curve took off. Most importantly, what it led us to was understanding a term that we started to call at Turbine called entertainment as a service. And it started to become how in a AAA game, and this is very common in all games today, uh, how do you in-game merchandise and sell goods and level ups and things of that nature without ruining a game balance? It led to Warner Brothers being very intrigued by what we did. And Warner Brothers ultimately very successfully bought the company as an entertainment as a service platform uh, for a, to deploy across the studio system. So the pivot worked, um, but the pivot was done out of desperation. Uh, we had to choose a different path. And we can say we were really smart in all those things. We were in the sense that we were trying to analyze elements, uh, but we chose the most likely path out of the, the 20 real potential things we could try to pull off. So I think the, the learnings are really, first, you gotta make the decision because time's your enemy. Um, two, uh, you, you have to have the buy-in. If you're the CEO, it's your job to make that decision. But it comes, it doesn't matter if you're the CEO, the team has to buy the decision. You're not gonna do it on your own. The team has to have buy-in. So how do you get that buy-in? And the only way you get that buy-in, not by dictate and say, this is what we're gonna do, is by, I believe, organically having built trust with the organization historically, which is so important in this time because if you don't have trust, you have nothing. Um, and then once you have that buy-in, Everyone just focuses and you ensure there's transparency, you ensure there's visibility, and you ensure that everyone knows that this is what we're doing. And everyone has to understand the risk and, and the upside for it, uh, and it can work. So there's no magic to it really at the end of the day. I wish there were. It was a lot of focus, a lot of prayers, um, but, um, and I, I'm not gonna lie, there was a lot of analysis and a lot of hardcore decision-making, a lot of hard economics and a, a lot of hard engineering uh, and, and entertainment that went into what we did in a game company. 
but a hard pivot can work. Uh, but we literally turned ourselves on our head at that time saying this game is free. How about it um, was radical. Uh, it was deeply radical. Um, not today. So it was, uh, it can be done. Um, and in, if you're going down that path, I'm happy to give a more detailed advice for anyone who's wants it offline. Mm -hmm. I have a quick counterpoint to that. Um, I have a specific methodology for pivots um, because, <laughs> because I've, I had to do it a lot at Pixability. Um, and so mine was, um, I, I had sort of this principle of financing 50% of our operations with uh, revenues from customers and 50% of, from investors. So that was try the balance that I was trying to keep. And so when I was noticing that, you know, we were doing things incrementally and the unit economics weren't quite working or, you know, it wasn't scaling quickly enough, um, but we were getting cash from it. Um, what I would do is I would have um, most people in the company continue along the path that was bringing us the money, mm. about 80% of the company and 20% focused on this new direction that we were trialing, or maybe um, there were several directions. And once the revenue uh, of this new area hit 20% of our revenues, I would pivot the resources exactly the other way around and mm -hmm. only keep resources on the really cash generating parts of the business. So at, at Pixability, for example, um, we started with, with some uh, things and had to add professional video production to our uh, portfolio of things that we had to do. Um, I had for years, I had a small unit of three people that were doing a couple hundred thousand dollars in video revenue that was subsidizing our software business. Um, and, and, you know, I didn't turn, eventually I turned them off, but, you know, they were just providing cash for what we were doing. So, um, and, and I think I did this five or six times. <laughs> I mean, this was, so that's why I'm t saying there, there was a, a method to it. Um, and, you know, I, I encourage people to, to experiment. And if they already have a business that is throwing off money, even if it's not ideal, keep that for a while, but try really hard to change things that are not working. Um, hard pivots can work. I just didn't have the stomach uh, or the financing to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, an interesting thing here uh, around this pivot conversation, um, when 2008, 2009 hit, uh, while everyone knew the sky was falling, everyone knew that it was going to change, it was going to end. Um, mm. I actually think what's happening right now with COVID is fundamentally different. The disruption is bigger, it's broader. Um, so the lessons that we all had were relevant to a world that maybe is fundamentally changed. I'm not smart enough to say it has, um, but I, I do believe the ecosystem, the larger environment that we're all operating in right now requires everyone to assume that the status quo is going to be here, at least from uh, an early stage company perspective, is going to be here for a long time. Mm. That, 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 that's my particular yeah. belief. And, and you need to inform your decisions based on that. Well, I think you raise a very important point, which is, you know, I do think there are some distinctions and there's lots of sort of economists studying what are the differences, but I think one of the things that we hear a lot of, the only certainty right now is uncertainty. Um, and I think Jim, you, you know, and Bettina, you mentioned this as well, in these times, making decisions in uncertainty is really hard. Um, and from a CEO and leadership perspective, you will have imperfect information, but you also want to be transparent and direct um, and particularly around your team and your employees. Um, you know, Jeff, I want to direct this one at, at you because I know you had had some experience right, the, in this space. I think actually you all have, so I'd love to have you chime in, but I'll start with Jeff. You know, what did you learn about decision-making in this time of uncertainty? Um, and particularly now, maybe it's even more uncertain than 2008. What advice would you have to, to leaders and companies about uh, making decisions and communicating those decisions with their teams? Yeah, yeah, you know, great, great question. So, um, you know, here's the thing. Um, 
when you're in the midst of a big shock like 2008-9 or currently now what we're going through in COVID and, you know, I'm going through these discussions and all these board meetings that I'm in with companies in the current crisis, I mean, you're never going to have all the information you want uh, in the midst of a downturn to sort of drive decisions like, you know, what's going to be the impact of my pipeline, right? How long is this thing going to last? You know, what's the world going to look like post-COVID in this case? Uh, how much and where to cut? And there's all these things kind of you're dealing with. Uh, but in the end, in the backdrop, it's important to be decisive. So, you know, obviously, uh, you know, you know, you're going to need to sit down, you're going to need to replan, you know, a conservative plan, maybe a couple scenarios, right size expenses, make, you know, structural changes where needed um, so that you can ensure that you have sufficient cash runway against the backdrop of uncertainty that, that is there. Um, and it's tough, but if you don't make those, if you don't make those sort of tough moves up front, then uh, you know, the, the, the whole company could be at risk as a result. But, here's, but the most important thing against uh, the backdrop against all of this is communication, right? And this is the big lesson for us. And I kind of look back in 2009, and we took our lumps on this a little bit. But you know, um, bring, the, bring your customers, all the employees, the whole company into the tent with you communicate early and often, right? So this is key. And, you know, you don't need to have all the answers out of the gate, right? And so don't wait until you do to start communicating. Uh, bring them in. Uh, you'll learn from the customers. You'll gain their trust. You'll get some great ideas uh, with the employee base, same thing, right? So, you know, reflecting on 2008 and nine at Demandware on this, I think this is an area, frankly, you know, mea culpa, we could have done a lot better. Um, you know, and, you know, going into the crisis, I mean, the demand where it was relatively small, but we were hot. We had come off a big first half of 2008. We'd won a couple of real, uh, our first real name brands as customers. Uh, we were raising kind of a next big round. Uh, there were even, you know, visions of maybe someday an IPO. We're starting to dance in our heads here a little bit and we're high-fiving in the hallways. Um, and, you know, I remember in a uh, third, uh, end of third quarter company meeting, we stood up in front of everybody and said, okay, we've decided we are a hiring machine, right? We're a uh, company is going like crazy. We're going to hire like crazy. Get ready. Everybody's getting wrecks. Go, 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 right? And, you know, <laughs> little did we know that that machine was about to run in reverse here uh, very soon. Um, and it was tough because, um, of course, you know, Lehman happened. The world uh, sort of changed very dramatically very quickly. So, um, you know, at first we did all the things you would expect, right? We, uh, you know, we froze hiring, cut some expenses here and there uh, and so forth and tried to, you know, make sure we could manage cash. But um, as we went through some replanning, we, uh, it became clear we were going to need to make some pretty substantial cuts to the company uh, headcount in order to really make sure that we could survive this crisis. Um, and uh, this is where we kind of got off the rails a little bit. And, you know, there was a lot of different opinions within the leadership of the company where we ought to cut and why. And we spent a lot of time with all the best of intentions collaboratively trying to figure that out. But the clock was ticking. And somehow we had convinced ourselves that um, uh, people in the company, our customers, people wanted hard answers and solutions to the problems. So it wasn't use really communicating until we had them. So we really under communicated. Um, and, uh, you know, as we kind of worked through all this and as a result, um, uh, it created a ton of anxiety, of course, with the lack of information, uh, rumors were rampant, you know, within our customer base, within our employees, created a lot of fear. Mm. Uh, and then as we rolled out the cuts, you know, people were surprised at how deep the cuts were. People felt out of the loop, felt like we made the wrong cuts. Wasn't I mean, it was painful. Um, in the end. And we, it took us a while to really recover from that. And so, you know, I kind of, I learned a lot from that. Um, and it's kind of served, uh, served me well and us well in, in kind of future years and crises that, you know, communication isn't about being buttoned down with all the answers, mm. right? Um, it's about being, you know, honest and authentic and, uh, and just engaging people and really bringing them into the tent, uh, closing ranks. And frankly, um, that's where you build trust. When they, where there's that honesty and people understand, you acknowledge the problems, you talk about uh, the trade-offs. Uh, frankly, you, you get better decisions, better, uh, mm -hmm. you arrive on better solutions because you're getting better input from more people. So I absolutely encourage uh, that kind of communication, not just within the company, 
but sort of touching on some of Jessica's points earlier that I think really resonate around, uh, you know, uh, the customer, right? Bring the customer in, your partners in to what's going on. Um, I even remember post uh, going public and demand where now suddenly we had this public company analyst sort of cohort out there we had to, to deal with and found uh, that, you know, sort of uh, honesty there, right, out of the gate really bought us uh, so much more credibility and the ability to sort of, uh, once we had their trust, to really manage a company through some difficult years. For example, you know, the, the meltdown around retail in 2010 was kind of a big deal. And, mm -hmm. and we built such credibility with uh, the investment community at that point that it helped us. Mm -hmm. So communication is really the key thing there. Being transparent and bring people mm -hmm. into the decision-making process. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I'd add, just one quick quick add on that, and that is I, I think another good technique in these moments of uncertainty is to give people a job, like something they can do. Because if, if we feel uncertain as leaders, like people that are deep in the business feel really, really uncertain because they feel like they have no control at all. And so defining what is in control and what's, you know, what you can control and giving people a job around that is, um, is really useful, is a really useful technique to manage through this. And it's also an opportunity to help your help build customer centricity from the inside out if you give people jobs that are related to the customer. So if you make it really clear how everyone in the business can help support the customer, um, it can be a great way to give people something they feel like they can control in times of uncertainty. It can also build a muscle that will serve you well long term. Hmm. I think that's hugely valuable. And it speaks a little bit to one of the questions that popped up earlier is how do you organize internally towards this customer centricity. And I like the layer you just added, which is it gives people a sense of purpose and something they can control in terms of what is actually our collective mission going after the customer. Yeah, I don't know if anyone's seen that Heinz, um, Kraft Heinz has an ad out right now and it's um, people in the factory floor talking about feeling like they actually have a role in feeding America during this time. Mm -hmm. So it's a really nice, like it's a nice message for Kraft Heinz, um, but it also was a great way to enroll the whole employee base and feeling like they had a role. And even if I'm just working, you know, on the factory line, I actually play a, a role in a bigger mission. Or there's a great um, story that the CEO of um, Boston Scientific tells about they'll bring people that have had stints put in, like Boston Scientific stints put in, bring them into the factories to meet the people working on the lines just so they can see firsthand the lives they've saved and the people whose lives they've made better. So I think these are just amazing things to connect, like the small jobs that we each feel like we do connected to a bigger purpose is um, a really great way to inspire an organization, but also help to build that customer centricity muscle. And now is a great time to do it. Hmm. I love that. Anybody, Raj, do you have any other lessons on communication or the leadership um, sort of making these tough decisions in the, in the time of crisis? Cause I think it's such an important topic and I think we've, we've surfaced some really important themes on which we, we touch on it. Yeah, I mean, a lot of great stuff covered. Maybe I'll speak at it from the early stage startup point of view it, is like you have uh, the ability to make lots of decisions and be wrong. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you're always trying to build an early stage startup to to address macro uh, macro environment. Well, when the macro environment is changing and there's uncertainty about it, you have this ability to to try new things as an early stage startup that a larger company doesn't. And that might put you in front of an opportunity, um, you know, that 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 has a lot of legs. So, as an example, um, you know, obviously, hey, you're hitting recessionary times, uh, and so you might go for a low cost option that's going to displace a uh, higher cost, uh, you know, software solutions or other companies. Um, collaboration is obviously going to be a huge thing right now. And so maybe you make that an important part of how your product works and it's better on the collaboration angle than your competitors. And, and, and these things, if you can um, make quick decisions on them, try them in the market, um, you know, product might take a little longer, but start some of it with messaging, right? Email your customer base or your leads with, with a, a subject, right? And this is a little bit to another question around how do you get feedback um, in, in this environment when everybody's concerned? Well, if your subject is something compelling to them that's gonna resonate, you're gonna get more replies. And so try new things, try uh, throwing ideas out there, seeing what resonates, um, and then be willing to go after it, particularly as an early stage startup where you have the ability to make that quick pivot. 
That's very helpful. Um, and I like sort of the blend of the early stage versus, you know, if you're at a large organization. I want to be mindful of time. We have a few, a few minutes. We can go to 15, but don't necessarily need to. So I'll keep looking at the questions. But I wanted to do a little thing I like doing, which is lightning round um, of questions. So I have a couple questions and uh, literally looking for very short one, two word answers uh, from our panelists. And I'll call on each of you. Uh, this is a question that we've actually been asking. I think I lead with it with almost every call I'm on because there's no right answer and I don't expect anybody to know, but I'm curious the opinions, which is as we look at the world we're in, um, what are people's expectations on timeline of when we, uh, one, lift lockdown, so that's the first one, two, social distancing, and then three, entering into a new phase of normal. Um, and so you're all grouped smart informed people but again there's no right answer but i'm always curious so lockdown social distancing new normal uh so i will start with the bottom of my screen uh bettina well um i'm in switzerland and my kids go back to school at least for half of the time on monday mm. so lucky uh, you <laughs> well, we <can> <laughs> great. okay so lockdown <laughs> okay <today. laughs> <laughs> the plan. So um, lockdown is ending here for us. It's different from uh, country to country. So we are coming out of it very carefully. Um, so that's, um, that's already happening. Um, the social distancing, I think that will stay for quite some time. Um, uh, at least for those people that don't have antibodies, which I don't know if I have them. Raj is the lucky one mm -hmm. here uh, that he knows he's had it and he's uh, he survived it. Um, but for those people, that will still remain probably till the beginning of next year, maybe even longer. It depends on the treatment options. And uh, the new normal is going to, <laughs> that's going to pretty much last forever, right? There's going to be, there are more pandemics coming. Um, and um, I think that we're all going to have masks at home from now on. Our kids are going to know what is going to, what needs to happen. It's just like, you know, post 9-11, we had all these different new things in our life, more security, um, things like that. So I think that will be, um, these new rules will be part of what we do. And I don't know how, um, when we'll ever shake hands again. I hope it will come. I do mm -hmm. want hugs. I want handshakes. Yeah. But, you know, public health is more important. Thank you. Good thought. Anybody else have a strong opinion or else I'll move to mine? Uh, I'll um, maybe provide the counterpoint. Uh, yeah. uh, just, uh, I, you know, it'll, it'll depend on the state and the country and, and all that. But I, I think that this is, lockdown is going to be relatively short lived, right? Like, you know, mm -hmm. months and and not many months. And when we look back on it in a few years, it's going to feel like, okay, yeah, that was a difficult time, but like it, it wasn't something that uh, um, lasted that long. And and I think, I almost think, unfortunately, the world's going to get back to normal in a, you know, in a relatively speaking near time frame. When maybe that's a year from now, right? But but the world's going to get relatively back to normal, maybe minus handshakes, but people are going to be on planes again, people are going to be commuting again. And, and, and all that, maybe it'll be 10% less or all that, but relatively same. And I say, unfortunately, because I, um, you know, I almost wish the world would slow down a little bit. Um, mm. you know, climate change is something that's always on my mind. And I'm like, man, I wish this could be a catalyst towards driving mm. some change. And unfortunately, I do not think it will be. Mm. Mm. See, I think I actually think there's a lot of opportunity in this. And we've been talking, my leadership team and I have been talking about, um, actually planning for a very different world coming out of this and what are the opportunities in that so I think first of all as a, a women for women working who often often feel the pressure of like productivity being measured about how much time you're in the office mm. I think there's an opportunity for some new metrics around productivity to emerge around this I also think <laughs> I also think there's some really great opportunities around um Servicing a global marketplace. I mean, we're, a, we're very like, we have very intimate client relationships. We spend a lot of time with our clients in person. Um, and we spend a lot of time bringing customers into our clients' place, places of work. And I actually think there's an opportunity to, to infuse customers into organizations virtually 
so they can have more regular interaction with them. And likewise, I would love to think that we have a global marketplace of clients now that we can service virtually. If we can build some tools and ways of working virtually through this, mm. that kind of open up the world in a different way and give us more flexibility. That's what we're trying to plan for. And we're even thinking about, like if we had half the office space we have, what could we use that space for that would be super different oh, and not have to feel like we've got all space for everyone to sit but actually it becomes like a more interactive hub and we have a hub in every, every city that's much smaller. I don't know, but I think like I want to push into what opportunities is this opening up for us to think about work really differently, even if things go back to normal. I think it's such an important question and, and a good way to sort of lead the conversation as we, as we think about it. You know, wh where are these opportunities going to be? and What does it mean from a social behavior change from a business opportunity? So I'd love to, to open it up. What are the other areas that people are excited about or see opportunity uh, arising from this? Well, I'll tell you, I think um, delivery pizza is going to be big uh, going forward. So that's, <laughs> that's a big one uh, in the near term. But uh, no, but, ser but, but seriously, um, you know, we talk about this concept of lockdown as like a binary issue where we're sort of locked down or we're not. And I think as we look forward, it's going to be a little bit more nuanced than that. You know, the people who are vulnerable and what have you, uh, uh, the elderly, the sick, are going to be continuing to be locked down for some period of time. Uh, and also, I think um, in industry, for some jobs, you just don't need to be in person as much. Mm -hmm. And so I think we've all, because this has been such a broad uh, crisis, it's touched really every company, every person, you know, globally, uh, it's really forced us to embrace technologies like uh, video conference and so forth that we just in many cases weren't culturally appropriate and what have you, but now our ways of operating are different. So, you know, I think uh, a lot of companies are already talking about, uh, you know, a new kind of work from home model, right? If you're, um, you know, Salesforce, a Zillow, the Zillow CEO said he's basically done a 180 degree pivot on the way he thinks about work from home, but now it's, it kind of makes sense. It's a good thing. So where we can stay home and be productive, which is a, a lot of the economy. I think we'll be doing a lot more of that. There's still room for in-person interaction, but I think there'll be less of it uh, as well. And so I think in that creates some interesting new business models that are out there. Um, I'll just give you one example. So, you know, I'm on the board of um, a, uh, you know, a retail oriented company. And I was actually talking with a, uh, you know, very large global retailer yesterday. We had a conversation around this topic and, he was relating to me that they are reopening their stores in Manhattan and globally starting uh, next week. And what they're doing, they basically deploy technology such that people don't need to go in the store. They've got this technology where you kind of, you're at the storefront outside, you, uh, you know, you hit a QR code with your phone. You can see all the inventory that's in that store right there. So they've effectively, you know, sort of exposed the inventory store by store. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, across which is a hard technical feat to accomplish, but they've kind of done that. And then you have the ability right there in real time to order, connect to an associate in the store, have them ultimately bring the product right to you outside, for example, right? Uh, we're also seeing, uh, you know, a lot of uh, movement towards, you know, how do we make curbside or buy online pick up and store more ubiquitous? Everybody's trying to solve that now. And mm -hmm. these things that have been sort of experimental and frankly, it moved, been a lot of hyperbole, but very little movement over the last five plus years, suddenly these things are getting real. So I do think there's going to be some uh, interesting new business models and ways of working that will generate opportunity for us. Great. I think that there's, you know, we certainly are very excited about a lot of the, the opportunities that will come out of this. Of course, there's challenges, but there is sort of a trigger and a kickstart for a lot of these big opportunities. Um, I want to be mindful of time um, and respectful. So uh, I just want to, unless there's no other sort of burning questions or comments, uh, any final reflections from the, from the panel um, on, on the opportunity side in particular? You just be ruthlessly op optimistic. I mean, the, the world's going through a painful time, but there is, Jessica just said, and Jeff mentioned, and not to turn a blind eye to the tremendous pain that's out there in the world by so many people. Um, but the opportunities, many of the opportunities that are still there, new opportunities are arising for all our collective businesses and individual businesses and being successful and optim optimistic about what you can do. You have to be realistic, but optimistic is infectious. And frankly, that will also go and help 
alleviate over time some of the pain that others are reflecting out there because these new opportunities lead to new companies or growing companies which will hire some of these people um so um the future's in our hands so let's go get it i, love so I have yeah. I, um, I have a an an offer for people so for over 10 years i have been offering uh, a weekly entrepreneurial office hour it's sort of my public my community service to help helping uh, the entrepreneurship community and i wanted to offer that to the webinar attendees um i have i will give anybody that signs up a, a half an hour slot to talk to me about their venture about questions they have um it's free so you got to take it for what it is right um mm -hmm. but um i want to offer that up and i Drive a lot of joy from helping others uh, weather a crisis like this, or help them develop their businesses. So, I'd be happy to uh, to connect, and I'm going to put my uh, my email address in the chat for those that want to take advantage of that. Wonderful, thank you. Well, great. Well, I think we we covered a lot of really important topics. Um, you know, from the opportunities of, of starting companies in these times and some things to think about, the importance of customer centricity, I think is such an important theme of employee centricity and how do you bring those two together to give a sense of purpose and meaning. I love that framing. Uh, making decisions in, in, in particularly in times of pivots, uh, how do you make those decisions? The importance of uh, transparency in your communication and how that can ultimately lead to better decision making. And then finally, sort of where, what are the opportunities ahead of us in this time? And I think this group is a group of uh, entrepreneurs and builders, and it's a, you know, supportive ecosystem, hopefully, to help do that. So um, lots to look ahead towards and lots to be excited about. So thank you all to our panelists for joining. Um, we really appreciate your time and your insight, sharing your expertise. And uh, we're very grateful and, and hopefully folks got some benefit out of this. And uh, to the group, thank you everyone for joining. We appreciate your time um, and hopefully this opportunity to connect and learn. And you can look for more from us from uh, our core community series and, and things that we'll try to do to bring this group together uh, in this time of, of, of separation. So thank you all and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye, Lily. Thanks, bye, guys. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you all. Bye-bye.